<laughs> We're laughing at the, uh, the wonderful backdrop. <laughs> so I was just telling Jared, um, had, I was thinking over the weekend about Hayek and John Stuart Mill. So Friedrich Hayek and John Stuart Mill. And I'm just going to talk to you. Um, so basically, Hayek was focused on, in some of his work on the fact that as society advances and becomes more complex, the range of information available um, that is accessible increases. And that actually makes it, though it's tempting for people, particular people who come out of science, to think, oh, so we could master it, like we can understand more and understand more and we can actually build the system that gets it all. We can make the right decisions. We can. He points out, no, as it gets more advanced, the ability for any one individual to have a depth of knowledge about the whole decreases. And even, so any group decision making, any centralizing of power really has to do with distillation and synthesis. And what that means is reframing and ign and rephrasing and in some way concentrating. So discarding the details and getting to some point, right? Some distilled and simpler version. So if you've got all these people on the ground who have all this feedback about what's working and not working and some of that stuff gets filtered and filtered and filtered, eventually it gets to a point where somebody who's being asked to make a decision doesn't really know what the heck's happening on the ground. They don't have all the inputs, so they aren't able to make an educated decision um, about what each of those, th what would be best for in each of those instances, so they end up having to make a decision that's like, you think this is a better one from where we're standing? And his point was, as society gets more complex, our ability to see the whole decreases, and the only way for us to, so though it's tempting for us to search for sort of the social justice thing, like if we can just, you know, master it all, we can balance all these things up and balance up the relative importance of the various options, and um, and then you know put them in a list, and and then we'll you know we'll accomplish them. The issue is there's no way for us to actually do that. There is no tablet or ledger where what is important to you and what's important to me and what's important to that person over there where those all get weighed up and balanced evenly. Nope. They all exist within our individual minds and we disagree about the relative importance of those different things. And in part that disagreement, ha disagreement has to do with our um, physical bodies <laughs> and our relativity. Nice. Right, our minds being our brains, some will call them minds, but our brains being housed within those bodies and us experiencing the world through this perspective and us being keenly aware of our needs and what we need and less aware of what others need. And, um, and so there's disagreement is the basic gist of it. There's disagreement about um, the relative importance of different things and there is no way um, to centralize all of that and come to a, a, a single uh, authority that can help reconcile all of all those balances. And so what Hayek basically was lobbying on behalf was you know, a system of liberty where you are free to do whatever you want but constrained by other people being free to do whatever they want, right? And John Stuart Mill a hundred years earlier, mapped out um, whether it was a hundred or it was seventy-five or whatever, don't know. Mapped out um, the harm principle, right? In in his sort of defense of uh, liberty and liberalism in in the book on liberty, and what he was saying was, all right, look, it's not okay for a community to coerce an individual into not doing an activity. Um, whether whether that's by the violent apparatus of the state or by the informal social norms, right, and potential ostracism, the peer pressure stuff. Um, 
it's not okay for you to coerce someone unless the action that they were going to take or are going to take would cause harm to another individual and the individual beyond them. And that that's like, oh yeah, that sounds good. You know, if it's harmful, then then you can stop them from doing it. But if it's not harmful, then you should sort of leave them be. And that's kind of how, what he lays down. And that seems like this wonderful thing. The issue is who decides what's harmful, right? That itself is subject to interpretation. And um, I think part of where Hayek either came to or where, where how I'm, I'm thinking about him is we are going to disagree about even that, about what counts as harmful. And if we have structures in place that enable us to disagree about what counts as harmful, I can go, well, I am going to say that that seems bad and I'm going to ostracize, right? Violence-based systems will not allow us to disagree because you end up having to come with one, so if you, by violence-based systems I'm referring to, monopoly of violence, government authority, you're going to imprison someone, you're going to execute them, right? Rule of law type stuff. Those systems force there to be a single decision that gets made by the community. And so um, they force consensus on that issue of was there harm or not. Even if you're trying to comply with this harm principle stuff, they force you to try to come to an agreement about is that a situation where we think it would be harmful. Whereas the peer-based ostracism stuff, nope, if I think that what she was doing was messed up and that that is something that would harm someone else, then I can steer away from her. And if you think that that's totally okay, that doesn't really harm anybody else, like whatever the action is, if it's her smoking pot at home and you worry that you know that's going to affect her unborn children. Not that she's pregnant, but just down the line it would need that's a reasonable thing, and you could be like, nope, she smokes pot, and I think that's not fair to her kids, and I don't want to support her. I I feel like that is... There's this, self, this self-balancing that happens in that way in small communities, and the stuff that I'm working on with the tech stuff, obviously, is trying to do that at a larger scale. But this harm principle, and we won't even agree about what counts as a harm, and that's partly why it's important for us to have these systems in place that enable us to disagree and yet get, get the outcomes where, not get the outcomes, be able to coerce um, where we find that appropriate. Like we should be free to coerce. Um, and you end up with us, yes, being free to coerce to, you know, one way to look at it is coerce. The other is to, we are free to steer away from something. We're free, free to steer our own actions. And I had a conversation this weekend with um, a lady that I was on a date with, actually. And she was she's somebody who does like mindfulness practitioner training. She teaches people about mindfulness stuff. And she's very much you know into unconditional love. And one of the things that she was... She was basically saying that, you know, even if somebody did something terrible to her, like she would forgive them and keep being with them. And was asking if, if my stuff that I was working on d- was dependent on judgment. Is the f- phone doing okay? Okay. Was dependent on judgment, on being judging of others. And she's like, I don't think that's okay because I don't want to judge others, you know. And I was like, okay, we'll frame it this way. It's not that you have to declare that they are bad or bad people. But if someone else is um, using slavery or raping someone and, and delivering some value to you, right? Like slavery. I'm using children as slaves to create this garment. You want to buy it? You deciding that you do not want to support children as slaves and don't want to contribute to that is not a judgment about that person. You could frame it as, this isn't you being evil to them. This is you being in control of your own life. And if you aren't willing to steer your own life, then you don't get the benefits of that, right? Like, you will not, you will be con- contributing to slavery. Um, and so I, I, it was an interesting conversation because it did force me to, rec- to, to, to 
to do something which my religious background actually always emphasized, which is you are trying to correct the behavior, not the person, right? Um, and I feel like that's that can be how you... That's really the elevated thought way of approaching this stuff, too. Um, no super simple wrapped up summary there, but thoughts? There aren't any. Yeah. I think one thing I'm... <clears throat> one thing that I haven't mapped out, but that I think is interesting to try to dig into deeper is the idea of coercion and how it's used from a political standpoint is really like it ends up in violence, right? Like it's backed by violence in some way. But growing up, I didn't see the word coercion that way. Mm -hmm. It was like my definition in my mind as a kid was something like kind of a sneaky way to try to convince somebody to do something, mm -hmm. you know? And, and there's, a, there's a little difference there. Mm -hmm. And I think if you, if you bring that down or kind of go off in another direction with that, there's this idea that you're trying to convince somebody to think of it differently or to act differently. You're not necessarily judging them. You're trying to change their perspective for a moment so that they might take another action next time. And I think that's very different, um, but that's kind of what comes to mind when I think of coercion, and I think that's part of that puzzle, mm -hmm. is trying to tease out that more constructive criticism type thing. Um, rather than just bending the arm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because I think there's lots of that there. And I certainly, and I think a lot of people, other, a lot of other people want to know when they're not doing the best they can or they're impacting people that they care about in a harmful way. Most of the time, we don't know how to broach that subject. We can't just stop the camp out and say, hey, it would be awesome if you helped out here. And he might want to help out, but doesn't know how to because he is out of his element. Mm -hmm. Or some other variation thereof. Um, and I think that's an important part of this in some way, is being able to discuss those things in more easily, in easier ways that allow for humans' inability to have those conversations all the time, in the moment. So hopefully, you know, we can figure out better ways to do that in a more roundabout way that is not, doesn't hack um, at our relationships. Because usually that's what happens if you, like, try to call somebody out. It's really, really, really difficult to do in a way that doesn't leave the whole situation worse off. Yeah, that doesn't trigger. Something negative, yeah. right? Yeah. Whether it's a reprisal or um, or something of that sort. Cool. Cool.